Welcome to CASDA's webinar series, a series related to the National Autism Strategy. Thank you for registering and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. My name is Rebecca Kinsinger and I am an autistic individual on the board of directors with CASDA. CASDA's vision is for all autistic Canadians and their families to have full and equitable access to the resources they need across the lifespan, where and when they need it. At CASDA, we are committed to ensuring the creation and implementation of a comprehensive national autism strategy that addresses the critical gaps in funding and policies which are preventing individuals who are autistic and their families from exercising their individual and equal rights as Canadians. Hi, I'm Mark Whalen. I'm a board member at CASTA and CASTA is a national organization working with leaders in the field of autism, parents, researchers, individuals with autism, people from big agencies, small agencies, to develop a national autism strategy that will make a difference in the lives of Canadians with autism. You'll see logos of our members from across the country, big and small. You'll also see a slide that have the logos of our, some of our key partners, who, while they're not in the autism field, recognize that their work has an impact on the lives of Canadians with autism. Together, we're stronger. Together, we're louder. Together, we can make a big difference. Join CASDA. Be part of this movement that is going to create a better Canada for Canadians with autism. I'm Leslie Peters, a board member with CASDA. On CASDA's website, the strategic plan is found in the About Us tab. CASDA represents the voice of autistic individuals, those who work with them, and those who love them. We engage federal policymakers on issues that impact individuals with autism across Canada. In the Our Work tab, you will find important resources. From 2007 onward, CASDA has worked toward a national autism strategy. Steps along the way include the Canadian Autism Partnership Project and the Blueprint for a National Autism Strategy. Hi, I'm Debbie Irish, the Chair of CASDA's Board of Directors. I'd like to take this opportunity to invite you to this year's 7th Annual Canadian Autism Leadership Summit taking place in Ottawa on October 5th and 6th. This is a great opportunity to engage with government while a national autism strategy is being developed. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors for making this a truly remarkable event. Please register now at www.casda.ca. Great. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's webinar, Conversations with MPs on the National Autism Strategy. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Karen Bopp, and I will be moderating the conversation today. I am a member of CASDA and the Director of Provincial Outreach at the Centre for Interdisciplinary Research and Collaboration in Autism at the University of BC. But first, let's start off with a brief introduction of our esteemed panel members today, and we're going to go from west to east. So first is the Honourable Don Davies. Don, give us a wave. Uh, Don is the NDP Member of Parliament for Vancouver Kingsway. A lawyer by training, Don has introduced more legislation in the House of Commons than any MP in the country. These include detailed plans for a national school nutrition program, free post-secondary -sec tuition for students with special needs, and a blueprint for universal pharmacare. Don is married with three children. His youngest daughter, now 25, has a general developmental delay. Along with his wife, they have been long advocates for quality, therapeutic, educational, vocational, and social supports for Canadians with special needs. Next, we have the Honourable Mike Blake. Mike, give us a wave. And Mike is joining us today with his son, Jaden. Uh, Mike is the PC Member of Parliament for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. In 2019, Mike was re-elected for a fifth term, receiving the highest vote, to uh, vote total out of all candidates from all parties across the country. He currently serves as Shadow Minister for International Development. Mike has two children, son Jaden, 24, uh, and daughter Janae, 21. The Lakes have been active supporters of autism organizations, families, and individuals across the country and around the world while sharing their story of life with Jaden, who has autism. And finally, last but last, not least, uh, we have the Honorable Judy Scroll. Give us a wave. Uh, Judy is the Liberal MP for Humber River, Black Creek. In Parliament, Judy has developed national, national solutions to local problems. As Chair of Prime Minister's Task Force on Urban Issues, she shaped policy on social housing. 
the creation of gas tax rebate, and the promotion of human rights and religious freedoms. As Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, Judy championed family reunification and promoted systemic fairness. Before we start with our questions to MPs, we just have a few housekeeping items to cover. Um, CASDA has four questions uh, for MPs, and then we will go to the questions submitted uh, by the registrants prior to this webinar, and we thank you for submitting those. We had quite a few, and we're going to try to cover as many as we can. We're also running a live Q&A, so we've enabled our ask a question feature. It depends on what device you're using, but usually if you scroll over uh, your screen, a uh, uh, taskbar will come up and it's the ask a question feature usually located right next to the chat. So just pop your questions in there. And if you miss anything, please don't worry. We are recording this on the CASDA YouTube channel where you'll be able to find the previous webinars and other related content. As a brief reminder, there is signups for the CASDA policy working groups, and those were from a recent webinar called Informing Canada's Autism Strategy, Lessons Learned from Across the Globe, and that can be found at the CASDA channel. And last, we'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks directly and tag hashtag National Autism Strategy, or you can retweet and share CASDA's Twitter and Facebook posts linked to this webinar. So without any further ado, let's, let's get to our questions. Thank you again uh, to the three of you for taking uh, time from your busy schedules during this uh, very uh, busy time for all of us across the country. So let's start. Um, the autism community in Canada was absolutely thrilled to see that all three parties endorsed the development of a Canadian national autism strategy. Judy, we'll start with you. Can you provide us with a brief update on the progress to date? And then I'm going to ask all three of you if you could tell us what are the key elements that you want to see in a national autism strategy as we move forward? Judy? Yeah, thank you very much. Great to see my colleagues and especially great to see Jaden on the call. Uh, and, and I have to give everything to Jaden because uh, Jaden has been an integral part over the last 20 years. Uh, that I've been in uh, Parliament because Mike uh, has brought Jaden to the House. Uh, he's really brought us into the issue for those of us who don't necessarily have children afflicted with it, but that know about it. And Jaden has shared uh, himself with us as parliamentarian, so I appreciate that. So just to give you a bit of where we're going and where we're at now, I first have to say, and I can't stop smiling about this, just how thrilled I am to see the progress that's been made. And that progress has been made because of parliamentarians like Don and Mike and myself and many others that cared about this issue, especially after meeting Jaden, and uh, decided we were all going to be pushing forward along with Senator Munson and others to, to develop that strategy. And Minister Haida, when she became the minister a short while ago, in her mandate letter, which is an important piece of uh, of direction. She was told to um, collaborate and work with all of the key stakeholders to develop that national autism strategy. And I can say that one of the commitments was that as of March 2020, uh, we would have access to online resources uh, to be able to help families move toward accessing innovative program models that would integrate health, social, and educational networks for the families that are, de are dealing with the issues of autism, the young people as to how can we provide employment, educational opportunities, and more innovation. Uh, some of the programs, Child Bright being one of them, Ready to Work being another, these are all initiatives that are coming to the front now as a result of the work that's being done on this issue, but especially on the national uh, autism strategy. So it's really going in an exciting direction. And I, and I can't say how pleased I am because I was quite surprised. I say this to Mike and Dawn in particular, when I got the updated notes from the department to see just how much progress has been made since 2015 and the money's there in 2019. It's Things are really finally, finally moving forward. And it's a many thanks to both of you, both of my colleagues. Thank you. So who would like to start with just letting us know, um, uh, 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 can you tell us a key element that you'd want to he have from the national strategy moving forward? Perhaps Mike, you're on mute. Sure, yeah, I, uh, we, can, we can weigh in here. And uh, you know, when I think about a, a national strategy, first of all, I think about something uh, I wanna see 
action. I want to see something that's going to activate, uh, of course, many of the uh, many of the responsibilities to do with autism would lie at the provincial level, but there's a, a significant role the federal government can play in, uh, in uh, bringing the best evidence from around the world. And I think of six areas of impact when I, when I think about autism and I think about Jaden and the, the times in his life, the lifespan um, approach to autism. I think about diagnosis in the first place. I think about uh, early intervention and help for him in the early years that he had. Um, I think about the education system and the impact at uh, um, a strong education system that's inclusive, focused on not just challenges, but skills and abilities and cultivating those skills and abilities. And then beyond that education system, what's the world going to look like in terms of employment for Jaden? What's the world going to look like in terms of um, housing for, for people like Jaden. And then, of course, every one of us is seized with thinking about what happens when we're gone. And so when we think about that lifespan, that's a really important part of the lifespan to consider is what kind of programs are going to be in place to ensure Jaden has the support and also the love and caring that he gets from us when we're gone. And uh, these are things that, that seize us. And, and those are areas that we have a lot of work to do, but if we work together at a national level, bringing in the best evidence from around the world, we can have a meaningful impact for um, people with autism in Canada. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Don or Judy, do you have anything to add about the key elements that you would like to see in an autism strategy as we move forward? Well, um, I'll, I'll go next as we moved east to west here. Um, and first of all, thank you to CASDA and for, for setting this up. It's a real privilege and, and pleasure to, to participate with my colleagues in, in something that I think, as Judy pointed out, is, is a matter of, of, of real importance to, to all parties. And I, I know the public sometimes sees politicians, particularly at the federal level, disagreeing on this policy or that. But I, I tell you, there's, there's in, incredible unity when it comes to working together across uh, across all party lines to to try to move a national autism strategy forward. Uh, Mike uh, mentioned many of the I think really important areas that 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 I think we all agree are are important. I mean everything from A to Z uh, needs I think more resources and needs more action on it whether it's you know it's early diagnosis and uh, individualized assessment and making sure that that our infants and toddlers and and children in schools get the actual support that is tailored to their individual needs. And I, I want to stop here and uh, pay homage to the fact that we're talking about an incredibly diverse community. Um, and 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 I think we have to all you know remember that our main purpose here is to make sure that each each person is looked at as an individual and is assisted to reach their full potential and contribute in the way that they can. So uh, all the way up to once they become adults, as Jaden is, uh, we start you know, shifting our focus to, to making sure that meaningful employment opportunities and, and housing uh, opportunities are there. Uh, I'll just pick one thing that I, I think should be mentioned. I think the government's done a really good job so far on implementing a, a national surveillance system. I think that was identified by the community some years ago. You know, prior to this and even today, we know every province has a different way of diagnosing, different intervention strategies. They, we don't track therapies as well as we, we might. Um, so I think, I think um, I'd like to see that ex, uh, accelerated because it'll really help researchers and clinicians and, and uh, autistic Canadians um, move forward. And I think we've done great work on that so far. So I'd like to see that, that momentum continue. Thank you. Judy, the elements that you wanted to discuss? Well, I, I think the whole issue uh, of the, the goal of the National Autism Strategy, aside from the raising awareness issue, uh, is to provide access to credible information, training for employment, employment opportunities, because I think that's really critically important. But also there has to be more support for the parents. Uh, of many uh, and many of the families that are dealing with the challenges and and want to do the best they can for their children um, but it's really difficult and and I've talked and I've sat and cried with some of the mothers in my own writing that are just you know they're, they're desperate for better resources and better access and support 
So as we're trying to focus on our young people that are struggling, we need to not forget that the parents need a tremendous amount of support as well. So I'd like to make sure we don't forget that part of it, because I think that's important because if the parents get the support, they can then in turn help their children that much better, help young people like Jaden that much better. So I like to make sure we don't lose track of that. Absolutely, thank you. The next question we have uh, for all of you is, how do you envision the National Autism Strategy developing? What role do you see autism organizations and the entire autism community playing? Perhaps, Mike, we start with you first. Yeah, I, I think that uh, first and foremost, I think it's really important that the community um, comes together on areas where there's common ground. Um, you know, just like any policy area that we deal with, People have different views, opinions on, uh, on what needs to be done, but there is a lot of common ground when we come together. I think CASDA plays a really important role in, in bringing people together. And we have to bring a wide variety of people together. We have to bring, of course, um, autistic Canadians uh, have to be at the forefront of the conversation. Um, and those autistic Canadians include people like Jaden. And so in Jaden's case, he's nonverbal, he has trouble communicating um, what he's feeling. Um, and so he needs help sometimes. And so you include families, um, families of young kids who are uh, just entering the process, maybe a recent diagnosis. Um, you include other experts, uh, you know, clinicians from a wide variety of backgrounds uh, and make sure that you're drawing on that best evidence from around the world on what works. And when I when I say what works, what we're really talking about here is so often we get really clinical in the conversation, but what we're talking about is helping individual human beings, all of whom are very different from each other, just like everybody's very different from each other, with different strengths and different challenges. And we want to help them to mitigate the challenges so that they can contribute their strengths to the benefit of, of society. And, uh, and that's what we're talking about here. So any national strategy, finds common ground. You're still gonna have organizations that might be focused on niche areas that maybe they're particularly interested in, and they'll still do that and be empowered to do that. But where there's areas of common ground, that's where we need to focus. And those areas I touched on early in the conversation are, are uh, you know, areas that impact people with autism, wherever they are in their lifespan, wherever they live in the country. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's critical. Great, thank you. Who would like to go next? about uh, uh, talking about where do you see the role of the autism community playing? Would any, Don or Judy, would you like to comment? If I can just uh, just briefly add on to what Mike has said though, um, in, in, in an appeal for individuals, community organizations to come together, uh, we all want the same thing. And if parliamentarians can put aside political differences and come together, uh, behind a national autism strategy to make it the best that it can be. Uh, I, I would expect all of the other organizations that truly care about these issues to come together and work with all of us. Together we can make a huge difference on these issues, but we can't make that difference if everybody's fighting everybody else. Dawn and Mike and I and our colleagues, they've all come together with Jaden's uh, help and direction. And um, we, but we need all of the other individuals, organizations, put aside your differences, come together behind the National Autism Strategy. We have a chance to make a huge difference. Let's not lose that opportunity. Thank you, Don. Well, I, I think if I could um, offer one really tangible suggestion, I think we, we have to, frankly, look for greater opportunities to involve autistic Canadians at all levels. And I think that's, that's a responsibility uh, that, that we have not, as politicians and policymakers, been as good at. One example is I, I think the Liberals deserve a lot of credit for establishing a um, autism mentorship program. But we've just recently found out that uh, you don't necessarily have to be autistic in order to be a mentor. Well, to me, I think it should almost be a requirement that we, we uh, this is an important opportunity to put autistic Canadians in those mentorship positions. Um, uh, I, it was pointed out to me uh, a day ago uh, uh, for in, in anticipation of this forum that someone asked me, well, would there be any autistic Canadians 
involved in this at a moderating level or otherwise, and I didn't know, but um, I think that's an, an example where we, we have to do we have to do a better job of involving autistic Canadians right at the at the policy making level, and I think we need to be aware of that. Uh, that we need um, we need those voices at the table in, in all levels of the discussion, and I think that'll help move the national autism strategy forward as well as be an important opportunity for the various uh, organizations across the country to to better have their voices reflected and heard. Great, thank you, John. Um, we'll stick with you first as we go to the next question. And I think you've offered some concrete suggestions, but can um, each of you share with us one concrete suggestion or a goal that you have for the National Autism Strategy? Yeah, I'm gonna cheat and sort of try to fit in two if I could. Uh, one is uh, I would like to see the development of national standards for, for early diagnosis and intervention that, that, that really is, is driven by an individualized assessment of each child. You know, at the end of the day, labels don't matter. When, when we have our children, um, uh, you know, when we're assessing their needs, um, we want to make sure that, um, that there's an accurate assessment of what, what their strengths are, what their challenges are. And then we want to make sure that they actually receive the help that they need. You know, getting an hour or two of speech therapy a month or something is, is not usually sufficient, but that's something I think that the community has gotten used to and it's not sufficient. So I think national standards backed up by federal money to provinces and territories who can demonstrate that they're gonna meet those standards and actually deliver those services. And the other thing I would mention quickly is for adults, I would like to see a federal job uh, support program for for uh, autistic Canadians, um, and maybe that can include education for employers, um, assistance with interviews, and and maybe even wage subsidy programs to uh, to help autistic Canadians um, deliver the massive amounts of talent and skills that they have, but often are not tapped into because of uh, our 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 workforce and workplaces are not really as aware as they should be. Great, thank you. Um, Mike, did you have any comments on concrete suggestions or goals for the National Autism Strategy? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm going to cheat as well. I'm going to <laughs> piggyback off of what Don said, because I think Don brings up a couple of really good points there. Um, first of all, that national standards conversation, it is an important conversation. There has been uh, too much of a patchwork of programs across the country. and. And uh, I think that a national autism strategy will, um, will really challenge provinces to, uh, to focus on what that, and I, you'll hear me say evidence a lot, what that best evidence shows works at various stages. So that would be one, one thing that I would talk about and, and really with a, a needs-based focus, acknowledging again, the differences, we're talking about people who have very different skills and abilities and very different needs, and there needs to be a needs-based approach is a big part of the conversation right now. Um, and, and secondly, I'll say this, this is, and this is a theme in terms of my presentations that I do across the country. Um, we talk a lot about inclusion, and inclusion is critically important, but I think that inclusion, I always look at inclusion as a gateway to contribution. I think too often we're kind of looking at um, focused on challenges and, you know, I, I want Jaden to be more than just included. Jaden has incredible skills and abilities that he can contribute to society. And our employment numbers are way too low right now in terms of uh, people with autism working in jobs that they're suited for, where their work will greatly benefit our society. And I wanna, I wanna see those employment numbers go up and I wanna see their contributions recognized. People with autism being paid properly for the work that they contribute. And, the, and, and I think that that's a, a meaningful, tangible goal for uh, a national autism strategy, in addition to many others. Great, thank you. Judy? Uh, there's three words I, I think that I, I want to see happen as a result of the strategy, and that's the, the issue of inclusion, accessibility, and employment. Housing has to be the fourth one that I think we'll talk about later. But um, 
one of the there's two new initiatives that have been introduced by the the government of Canada that I need to mention in a very long title here, but it's the Autism Intellectual Development Disabilities Natural Resource and Exchange Network, which is up and running. And it is providing resources, it's a start, but it's meant to be there to provide resources and inventory of services and so on that. So it's that really first step online to be able to help families when they need that kind of support, where they get it, where do we find employment? So it's all linking into other things. The second initiative that uh, the government put out uh, $20 million for to, to see achieved was the ASD Strategic Fund. And again, it's providing support for community-based programs that pursue innovative program models, reduce the stigma, integrate health, all of the things that we are talking about as the three of us that we wanna see happen. So those two initiatives, there was $20 million in the last budget for that to happen. Both those initiatives are, are active and, and being implemented as we speak. If you can go, you can go on the website, and uh, you know they had said March 2020, and I was um, I was not sure that was going to happen, and so I was very pleased to know that it has happened. It is up there, it is running, and it is. Uh, they had a soft launch of that uh, particular initiative, uh, but later on there, I, I would hope that there would be a stronger launch so that more people know about it. And they're adding new information every day. So I don't know, Mike or Don, if you've had a chance to, to go on that site, but it is up. And there was that commitment from March 2020 to, to see that site up there. And it is up there and it is running. So certainly appreciate your comments later on as to uh, what your thoughts are from, from, from yourselves or from any of your listeners. Uh, I, d I have to report back to the minister. So let me know what else uh, she needs to be doing and putting some emphasis on. So we're gonna hold her feet to the fire as well. Great, did Donna or Mike want to comment on that or should I go to the next question and it will be within there? Okay, so um, for the, the question and then we're, then we're gonna go to some of the submitted questions. Uh, if we were to meet again uh, a year from now, what do you expect should have been accomplished uh, within a year? And then look further into the future, what does success look like five years from now? So um, who would start, maybe uh, Mike? Unmute myself there. Um, Success a year from now, um, I would say, well, first of all, we don't actually have a national strategy yet. So um, the very first step is that we actually have to take that next step and, and develop that strategy. Um, now, success moving forward looks like um, entities, provincial governments, municipalities, um, actually acting on items that will fall within the national strategy. So I notice, uh, I, I'm kind of watching the Q&A here, and I notice Christopher Whalen weighing in here and talking about police officers, for example, not really understanding what autism looks like and, and uh, um, some real challenges. We've heard about these challenges in the past. I think that's a, a fantastic question because it fits into the type of meaningful action that we want to see because a national autism strategy can engage municipal entities, law enforcement entities, transit authorities. Um, there are so many different areas, so many different challenges that happen because um, people just don't understand. And if you work, there's, there are cities like Laval, I understand, that is an autism friendly cities. We see cities across the, uh, uh, across the country and around the world that are implementing autism friendly policies at that municipal level so that there's a greater understanding and law enforcement would be an example of that the type of tangible thing we're talking about but really ultimately i want to see comprehensively in all of those different areas we mentioned steps forward so steps forward on continuity regarding early intervention um, steps forward in terms of our education system and getting more out of our education system for people with autism um, to unlock those skills and abilities we talked about, which will lead to higher employment and, and uh, better housing outcomes, an integration um, uh, into all of these different areas. I could talk for a long time on this. I'm going to let my colleagues weigh in because I think this is a, a really important first step. And if you were to go back a year, we've taken a huge step by just having three colleagues sitting on a webinar right now, 
talking about common ground that we have from three different party perspectives. So. Well, if I could weigh in, I mean, Mike, Mike, uh, you know, gave a, an excellent kind of overview. It's sometimes these policy areas, I think, can be overwhelming because there's so much to do in so many areas that we risk, um, we, we risk not being able to really uh, measure how we're going forward. So uh, I agree with Mike. Uh, what does success look like in a year? Well, let's have a documented, written national autism strategy. It doesn't have to be perfect at this point. Uh, I think it's a can be an organic process that that can change over time. But let's get something nailed down in writing, and let's have let's have measurables um, with time limits on it, backed up by resources for action. And uh, you know maybe we should develop a five-year plan so that we can pick out of all the the myriad of things that we really need to make progress on, we can we can highlight, um, you know the a prioritized list of areas and then uh, you know make make gains towards those over time so that we can actually see how we're doing. Uh, I think one thing we're really good at right now is we understand where the needs are. I think the the autism community in Canada has done an excellent job in making uh, their elected representatives uh, much, much more aware of uh, not that we not that we don't have a lot to learn, but we're much, much more aware of where the challenges are. So I think now's the time to actually translate that knowledge into into a plan and action. And uh, you know, I, I'd hope to be having a conversation like this a year from now, where we can look back and say, okay, we let's say we developed uh, a housing program that has actually. We got you know hammers in the ground uh, or hammers in in people's hands building housing for people with neuro uh, neurodiverse needs. Um, you know maybe we have a, a federal jobs program to support uh, autistic Canadians, etc. So I I'm I think what we need is action. Great. Judy, did you have comments of uh, where we will be a year from now and and then five years from now? I think the five years is. Uh... It's really exciting if we can achieve even a portion of what it is that we want to achieve. So in a year from now, we're going to be building on the National Autism Strategy uh, as part of the National Disability Accessibilities Act. So I think that's really laying down a platform that's uh, going to give us some real help in moving the agenda forward. But when we talk about bringing people together, the autistic people, provinces, governments, citizens, it takes all of us to find solutions. Uh, there was a report done by Public Health, the first time ever, federal, provincial, and territorials on the issue of autism, the spectrum disorder spectrum, surveillance system report. Mike must know, uh, is probably familiar with that. And that's the first time there was ever a report done uh, by all levels of government talking about where are the gaps in the system. So that provided that roadmap that we keep talking about that we need to build on that Mike and Don have also mentioned. Those are the things we need to be building on and, and pushing forward. I think, I think the government has taken some huge steps and I don't wanna wait five years for us to say, you know, we really had some success here. And I think it's important that we, together with autistic people and the community and leaders like yourself, Karen and Jonathan, and CASDA and the others, that we work very tightly together to push forward. I think we have a unique time and place right now, and I, it's imperative that we don't lose this opportunity. I've been there 20 years, Mike, and I think you've been there just about the same amount of time, and Don, probably not much different. And I know that we've had these discussions, and I've been told we could, 20 years ago, this is not a federal issue. You know what? This is right front and center on the federal government's issue. Federal government is funding it and helping to push it forward. And I just want to see us continue to push so we get even more success than what we've already had. Great. Thank you. So we're going to move on uh, now to some of the submitted questions. We received quite a few. Thank you very much uh, to those who took the time to submit some questions. We tried to amalgamate uh, some of them so that we could cover as many as possible. So the first one, and I know Dawn and all of you, Mike and Judy, have touched on this. Um, the first one is this. Some autistic-led ad self-advocacy organizations favor an inclusive national disability strategy as opposed to a national autism strategy. How can autistic-led organizations discuss position and play a lead role in uh, what the government has committed to thus far? 
Well, th thank you for, for the question. Um, you know, I've uh, been a parent of, uh, of a child who's now 25 years, years of age who was uh, born with a global developmental delay and she has a cluster of, of challenges. Um, so my wife and I have been working um, with the neurodiverse community for the last several decades. And what I can tell you is there's a, a, a better, there's a need to better support the entire neurodiverse community uh, across the board because there's unique challenges um, um, you know, that we all face um, with our children and, and, and adults um, and people, um, people living with autism and autistic Canadians, but the, the, the needs are common, I think. So, you know, what do we need? We, everybody needs individualized assessment. Um, we all need uh, individualized support tailored to the needs of each child and adult. We all need um, programs for housing, employment, and, and, and social support, inclusion support, um, no matter what uh, challenges we're all living with. So I think that um, there's a lot of expertise and wisdom and energy in the autism community. And I think they're, it's a natural leader. But I would like to see a partnership as we bring together um, the various components of the entire neurodiverse community and share best practices and work together. Because the, I, I think the questioner, if I'm understanding the the the, the, gen, the genesis of the question is quite correct is that uh, this isn't just an autism issue this is an issue of how we can better support Canadians across the board who in who have uh, neurodiverse um, um, contributions to make great thank you Mike or Judy did you want to comment on uh, uh, this issue as well as how autistic led organizations can play a lead role in what government's committed to so far well, I think, you know, if you look at the uh, Accessible Canada Act, uh, which was a major accomplishment, I believe, when we talk about accessibility and some of the challenges that, that Don and Mike have mentioned earlier, it's about accessibility and it's equality of access. Uh, all of those are important things, but we cannot be separated. It, it, you know, we need to be working together. And the, I, I would hope that the more involved any of the organizations that have a particular interest in in some challenges for some of their families or some of the community members they, they, they'd all be participating along with the government when we look at the issue of accessibility and ensuring that we have the programs out there that are that are necessary everybody has to work together it doesn't matter whether you're pushing one side of an agenda or another uh, be involved be part of it respond to it but I have to go back to what Dawn has said about the individual assessments for a moment, because I don't think we need to forget that because we go right back to one of the issues that I've continually heard from families is they, they couldn't get a proper assessment done of their young person. And it took years and years of uh, incorrect assessments and the rest of it. So one of the things I'm certainly gonna push for is to make sure at the very front, at the very beginning of, of a young person's life, if there's issues being flagged, that they get the proper assessment so that they can be started off getting the ultimate amount of, a, of help that we all want to give to them. So I think that's a really important part of this whole future where we're moving towards. Absolutely. I'll wait too, Karen. Mike? Um, yeah. yeah, there's, there's a, I think there's a couple of different parts to your question there. So one is the involvement of um, autistic Canadians in the conversation in a leadership within this conversation around this um, and I think that's been a, a really important move forward probably in the last five years I would say uh, in terms of the movement with the you know the 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 uh, working group and then the moving forward in 2017 with the uh, with the ask um, there was a, a very strong seven person um, self-advocate advisory committee that was part of that in the last couple of years at the CASDA summit. My favorite part of the CASDA summit over the last few years has been when the self-advocates uh, present as, as part of the summit. And I think um, that's an, an important movement. And one of the things that's kind of interesting is that for self-advocates who um, can communicate what it's like to have autism, their, their place on the spectrum is different than where Jaden is clearly on the spectrum. And, uh, um, and so, 
you kind of listen sometimes and sometimes the inclination is to say, well, Jaden's situation is different. But I've learned a lot as I've kind of reflected on what I hear from, from uh, autistic Canadians who can articulate um, what it's like and what some of the challenges are. And, and uh, um, one of the things that I've reflected on a lot is this idea of self-determination and people with autism uh, having that opportunity to self-determine. And my first inclination is to say, well, Jaden can't fully self-determine because he's not aware of danger. You know, if he fully self-determined his path, uh, he might be hit by a car before the end of the day because he doesn't really understand traffic and the challenges dealing with traffic or, you know, big dogs, which he loves, right? He'll run up and squeeze the squishiest part of the big dog while he throws his face in their, in their <laughs> face because he loves the smell of the breath and the feeling of the tongue on, their, on his face. But he doesn't understand the danger if you squeeze a German shepherd that you've never met before in its squishiest parts. That's probably not the safest uh, avenue to, to go down. But then as I reflect more on this sort of self-determination, it makes me think about my communication with Jaden and how often we're impatient because of the way we're wired. And if we just show a little bit more patience, pay a little bit more attention to what Jaden is saying without speaking, which oftentimes he's saying things beside me all day. Right now he's telling me he's tired. <laughs> but, uh, but oftentimes he's saying things without speaking. And, uh, and we just have to be a little bit more patient and give him that opportunity to express himself in the way that he expresses himself. And so it's something that I've, I've learned listening to autistic Canadians who articulate what some of their frustrations and challenges are. The second thing I'll just jump into quickly because I've taken enough time in this intervention is to say on the, um, on the broader question of, of disability and a disability strategy, I would say that it's important for us as we work on a national autism strategy, I always think about it as breathing. And I think, you know, what we learn in working on a national autism strategy and we inhale information from that and then we exhale it to the broader disability community and even to the broader community, forget disability in there, the broader community. And then we inhale from those communities what we learn in that process and we can exhale it back into the autism community. And it's uh, just, a we want that process to be as natural as breathing, where we're, we're improving each other as we interact together in, uh, in the various ways. Great, great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna sort of skip a little bit too, because we are uh, in, a, in living in a world where there's a global pandemic. And how can we respectfully keep the need for a national autism strategy on the federal government's radar? Um, uh, when COVID-19 is understandably um, an urgent priority right now. Judy, would you like to start with that one? I wouldn't take one away from the other. Certainly uh, dealing with the COVID-19 is a, a tremendous responsibility for all of us as parliamentarians uh, on behalf of our constituents and our families to do everything we possibly can to be helping Canadians. But those Canadians include autistic people as well. And we're not going to forget them because we're having to deal with the coronavirus. They're every bit as important to us now as they were a month ago and they will be a year from now. And I think it's up to all of us. We, we wanna make sure these issues stay front and center. And, um, and I think you'll find that we will because it makes whatever, we can have an awful lot of tragedies this whole year, but it doesn't mean that we forget our own personal interests, our own personal responsibilities to drive an agenda forward as parliamentarians that we know is critically important to Canadians. The coronavirus is here, it'll go away at some point and, and hopefully all of us and Canadians will still be here to enjoy this wonderful world we live in but we still have responsibility to do other things and to make sure that we're pushing forward other agendas. And as parliamentarians, we're used to dealing with many different things. And, uh, and I think we're gonna to continue to move forward and try to drive forward the agenda, uh, coronavirus or not. Thank you. Don? Well, I agree very much with, with Judy. I mean, it, you know, the truth is, is that their you know, government is dealing with many, many issues at any one time as a matter of, of normalcy. Um, but I think we do have to acknowledge that when you have something that is as, as extraordinary as the present 
you know, COVID-19 health crisis, that does, that does divert attention for sure. For instance, I know the Canadian Institute of Health Research, they cancelled their spring 2020 project grant competition. That's a, a major funding uh, where we had 2,000 uh, plus researchers who applied for biomedical research. That was a, that was a casualty of the of the current situation, as we had to rapidly shift resource uh, research resources to COVID nineteen. Now those will come back, but it kind of does show how we always have to keep our eye on the ball and make sure that um, we we keep the resources flowing at all times. This is a long game, um, you know. I, I would like to see something like maybe uh, a national roundtable on on neurodiversity that was scheduled every single year. Where we brought together organizations across across the um, neurodiverse spectrum um, to make that a permanent, concrete advisory kind of situation, and I think I think institutions like that help in making sure that we we keep we keep things moving um, at a regular, um, predictable pace um, when we risk having being knocked off prioritization by, by things like COVID-19. But Judy's absolutely right. I mean, I, I don't have any fear or concern that that's happening now. Um, and, and, uh, I think the government is, is every bit as committed as it's always been. Great. Mike, did you have anything to add? And then we'll go on to our last question. And, and yeah, I, I, think so I do. I, I think, um, I think in the context of COVID, I think there's a few things. First of all, Jaden's taking a break now, so he's uh, he's off screen playing with a video game, playing a video game with his sister right now. Um, but a uh, uh, couple of things. So so with Jaden, I think about the fact there there are some challenges that come to light with COVID, right? Jaden Jaden doesn't wash his hands very well. Um, he doesn't really understand social distancing, the idea of physical distancing or whatever the case is, he really, really likes human contact. And so if he was out and about, it would not be unusual for Jaden to grab a stranger's hand, for example, or grab their arm or whatever the case is. And that can lead to misunderstandings. And if you start to think about that in different contexts at a global level, let's say you were in a refugee camp, for example, and had someone like Jaden in that refugee camp, it might be really challenging because people wouldn't necessarily understand why it is that he's doing what he's doing. And um, quite frankly, it could be, it could be dangerous for people uh, if he's just not aware of some of those things. So there's challenges there. But at the same time, uh, one of the things that, that I've thought about a little bit is as we're navigating this world in sort of Zoom world or whatever, video conferencing, we're all, we're all much more reliant on technology than we would otherwise be. And much of that technology is worked on by people who are on the autism spectrum who are phenomenal at that detail orientation stuff that level of focus and detail that it takes to develop the technology that we're talking about right now and so um you know i'm i'm thankful that there are many people who have that ability to focus in ways that that uh that maybe we can't to make sure that these things happen and develop the the incredible technologies that we're using I will comment one other thing just because I'm glancing over to the side and seeing the, the comments a little bit. Um, and I see a couple of people that I know, Corey, uh, Corey Walker weighing in on the comments here talking about uh, more autistic people running for politics. I think that would be a fantastic idea. Um, and so uh, really encourage people who might be watching to think about that at some point in time. Um, I, I noticed Vivian co commenting in the Q&A about non-speaking autistics and how she says we can and do communicate and sometimes we just need to have the proper supports in place. That is something that absolutely an autism, national autism strategy should be focused on is those individual conversations talking about that needs basis because um, can you imagine how frustrating it would be to have something to say and no way of saying it and, uh, and, and not being able to get people's attention to say those things that, that you want to say. We're always encouraging people to get involved in that democratic process. And those of us that are elected, I'm sure Don and Judy would share this, sometimes a little bit of frustration that it's hard to get people engaged in the conversations uh, <laughs> in that sort of civic responsibility. And yet you have people that have something important to say, want to say it, and we don't have a mechanism to, uh, to unlock that, that voice and that input. And uh, um, that's a real challenge for us. Uh, can, Karen, can I just add yeah. on, you know, the Accessibility Canada Act, for the first time ever, do we have that? 
And, and you know, so I think having that act, the Accessibility Canada Act for a barrier-free Canada, that's a barrier-free Canada for everybody. It's not just one particular group or another. And so that's about reducing all of those roadblocks and providing all those opportunities. So the fact that we've passed legislation for a barrier-free Canada, uh, I think is, is exciting. And I think it's gonna help us to move this agenda forward as well. Great, thank you. Um, very quickly, so perhaps maybe sort of a 30 second uh, to a minute answer each. How will a national autism strategy help autistic persons and families in their home communities? Um, you know, many uh, submitted questions about issues like housing, employment, education, treatment approaches, affordability, uh, long-term care. What are the issues that you feel around there in terms of helping uh, on the ground in their home community. I'm going to mute because there's a phone ringing in my head. Perhaps uh, um, Don or Mike or Judy, who would like to start? Uh, I'll start. Well, I, I think um, I think we've identified uh, quite a few of the the major areas that 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 you know need we need progress on in order to actually result in in you know, families and individuals in their communities feeling that things are improving. Um, you know, to me, it always comes down to to action and resources. You know, um, I think we, I think policymakers um, have a, a good enough idea, at least to get started at this point, um, on things like housing and employment and and early diagnosis and and sharing research information and better clinical work and involving. Um, Autistic Canadians, you know, finding ways, uh, in fact, demanding that that their voices be heard. So let's get to work and start implementing. It. Um, you know, as I say, talk is cheap. What what's going to matter at the end of the day is that people start seeing progress and action. And you know, it seems trite to say, but that comes down to um, putting money towards these things, um, uh, having standards and accountability, and measuring, and and involving people. And I think when we start doing that, and I think it's very exciting, I think, you know, Judy's enthusiasm has been infectious. You know, this is an exciting prospect for us because this is nation building. This is, in, this is community building. This is making inclusion real. And I think it's, the, it's one of the most important things in politics. So, so let's, let's, let's get to it. Great, thank you. Mike? Yeah, so, um... Yeah, weigh in a couple of different things. So one of the things as we're going through the COVID uh, uh, crisis, uh, a phrase that gets used a lot is we're all in this together. And, uh, and really, we've all kind of witnessed the power of stories and individual stories from around the world in terms of, of what people are going through and how they're coming together without physically coming together to, um, to, to take this on. I think that there's lots to learn from that. There's a, a power in stories. And we have to remember as we're crafting something at a national level, we have to remember where it is that we're, who it is, the individuals we're trying to help and the whole spectrum of, of, of people that we're trying to help uh, across the country. And if, if, if what we're doing is just a bunch of meetings and a bunch of conversations and it's not actually meaningfully impacting someone's life on the ground, um, then, then we have to rethink what we're doing. And Don makes some fantastic points in terms of measurables, in terms of proper funding levels, um, talk about evidence, all of those different things. What we're doing has to make a meaningful, uh, a meaningful difference in people's lives. And again, following the chat and kind of uh, weighing in, and, and, and Vivi and I have had a couple of uh, conversations uh, over time or um, exchanges over time, um, but I'm notice, noticing her taking me to task for uh, dividing between someone like Jaden and, and a self-advocate. And I, I love that challenge. And, and uh, I love the fact that it makes me think of things. And I just wanna sort of clarify that I think what I'm saying when I'm talking about that is just the fact that like as a society, we all are different. We all are unique individuals with unique skills and abilities and um, unique challenges and things that are going on in the background in our lives that other people don't know about and all of those different things. Likewise, people with autism across the spectrum also have unique skills and abilities. And, and we, we ought not stereotype people 
in one category or another category. Certainly the fact that there's a common diagnosis of autism means that there's going to be a commonality and there's going to be a shared experience, a level of shared experience to some degree. And uh, certainly, um, you know, Vivian and Jaden can learn from each other because they have that common shared experience. And at the same time, they're both individual people with their own unique situations and circumstances. And I think we have to be able to navigate that nuanced uh, um, um, circumstance or, or difference. Uh, and if we all come to that um, place with a, a heart to help people, that we want to try to help people just as we often need to be helped ourselves in, in, in our own lives, I think that's a great place to start from as we try and come together and, and, uh, and work together. Great, thank you. Judy, did you have any comments or should we look to questions? We're very close to uh, near the end. Jonathan, were there why don't you go ahead yeah. and get another question? I'm sure it's very important for them. Yeah, and, and my thank you for uh, monitoring the chat and, and responding over time as well at our, our chatting. Any specific questions that you wanted to send me that, because I'm not monitoring that, uh, Jonathan is wanted to send me uh, from uh, the the group or did you want to just sort of come on and ask them yourself technology there can I just throw I'll throw yeah, out sure. I'm, I well, am it. okay yeah. so there's a there's a, a note from Chris here how will underdiagnosed and underserviced communities be included in this strategy there's a gap in diagnosis for racialized people women and AFAB assigned female at birth and many cannot afford assessment. So that's a, a big question. Now I asked the question, so I'm going to let one of them answer it first while I presented it from Chris and then I'll weigh in after if one of you guys wants to weigh in. Would you like me to repeat the question? Can you see it there? Sorry, John. No. Sorry, what was the question? How, how will underdiagnosed and underserviced communities be included in this strategy? Yes. Underdiagnosis is a big, is a big issue, yes. um, right? And there's a gap in diagnosis, particularly here, uh, Chris notes, for racialized people, women, and AFAB, I'm not as familiar with that term, assigned female at birth, and many cannot afford assessment. So. Well, I think it goes back to what Don had said earlier that, and that I had also followed in with the issue of assessment, how critically important having those assessments done early. How do you get those assessments, especially you shouldn't have to, you, most people in those situations probably don't have the money, but that's, those are things the provincial government should be walking up to the plate and if a parent or a family asks for an assessment to be done, it needs to be done. And it needs to be properly done, not the way some of them are done that I have heard about where it took years and years before someone was truly assessed with, uh, assessed with the problem that they had. So again, it's this has to be, the provinces and municipalities have to be working with us as well. This is not just a federal issue. Mike and I know that because they told us it wasn't a federal issue for 20 years, that it took to get it onto the agenda as a national issue. But we need to be working with our provinces, our municipalities, and other organizations to make sure that people who want to be assessed, need to be assessed, get the proper assessment. Well, I, I would just add to that. Uh, I think that's a very important point of raised of the intersectionality that permeates all questions like this. Um, you know, when you have when you have. <clears throat> other issues that are compounding it, issues of poverty, issues of, of race, issues of, of um, in living in remote communities, uh, the, the fact remains that these do, pre these do present additional barriers that make um, access more difficult. That's why I'm, I'm a very strong proponent of a very strong, well-funded public health care system um, mm -hmm. and educational system as well. Every parent mm -hmm. and every, every individual should be able to access timely, uh, equal care, um, uh, you know, upon demand. And as Judy says, that is, that is the primary responsibility of the provinces. Um, but I think the federal government does play a role. The federal government does give a transfer to the provinces. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we have to, you know, 
we're always, I'm in opposition. I'm always saying we need more, we need more. And I know the government's got the realities to deal with, but, um, but I think we have to press for uh, more funding. It's not adequate right now to make sure that everybody can get access to timely assessments. I know parents that have to pay out of pocket uh, and then others that don't even get it at all. And so if you have a child that's getting assessed at, at, at 12 or 18 months or two years, that's very different than if they're assessed when they're four or five. And, you know, I, I think we want to make sure that, that, that all of our children and all of adults can get access to quality services in a timely manner. And I'll, I'll just weigh in quickly. Um, so to Don's point on intersectionality, I mean, I think that is, it, it's critical to understand when we, when we take a look at the research on autism, you know, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in research that, uh, you know, to understand the sort of the, the, the gender balance there, because I think the, the numbers still used are four to one, but we don't really understand why they're four to one. And I know that there's, um, uh, I know that there's fantastic gender-based research going on. Um, one of the things that I notice in talking to self-advocates, uh, particularly women self-advocates, is how many of them um, were diagnosed much, much later in life because it was looked at differently. There's different stories. You talk to different people, you get different stories each time. And I'm not a researcher. There's people that know much more about this than I do. Um, most importantly, the women themselves who are diagnosed later in life and can speak to the impact and what that means in their life. And you hear every story, it's every story is a little bit different in terms of that impact. But, uh, you know, understanding the, 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 the uh, impact of being in a remote area and not having access to um, diagnostic, diagnostic services. Um, you know, there's just, there's so much that needs to be included in this strategy. That's one of the reasons why constantly using the word comprehensive as we focus on this. And we don't have to have it all figured out, but I think as Don was saying, it's more or, earlier in the conversation, it's the organic nature of a strategy. If you build it organically and build it to be able to evolve as we learn more and move and talk to more people and include more voices, it'll, it'll start from a great place and it'll just get better and better and more impactful over time if we do it right. You know, if I could just add two, two quick points to this, that um, on the gendered um, aspect, you know, I was quite shocked as health critic to, to learn that clinical studies were, um, were, were designed for and executed on men up until shockingly recently, I don't have the exact date in front of me or the year in front of me, but it wasn't that long ago that clinical studies were done on men without recognizing, of course, that that uh, uh, non-males um, have very different systems. And uh, I noticed in one of the comments that a comment that uh, many of the assessments were designed for boys. So. So that's something that I think we need to really take a look at. And I know gender is only one aspect of the intersectionality. And the other point I would make is I, I think one thing the COVID-19 crisis has really revealed is how exciting the opportunities are for virtual care. And so for people who do live in remote areas, I think we have to do much better at, at delivering quality care virtually. And I think the opportunities are, are really um, exciting in that, in that respect. Well, um, uh, this has been a, a really exciting uh, and interesting and, and uh, conversation uh, with the three of you today. Uh, thank you so much for taking uh, the time out of your, your busy schedules to join us. I see from the chat that it has um, raised a lot of uh, great questions and started some excellent conversations. Um, uh, Kazda uh, would like folks to know that um, I'm looking over my notes here that uh, we will they will be having a, a an FAQs coming up in the in the in the coming while because we didn't get uh, to hardly a, a, you know a, a tenth of the questions that were that were posed in the chat and so we'll be saving all of those comments and questions so that we can uh, take a look at them and have it inform future conversations. Uh, we do have a panel coming up. Um, I don't have the date on me right now. Maybe Jonathan can privately text me um, uh, what that is with the senators. Uh, I think that's next week. Um, uh, so that will be another exciting conversation uh, with uh, federal leaders uh, from across the country. Uh, lastly, everybody will get an email uh, from CASDA for their feedback. Um, and yes, the, the webinar uh, with the senators will be next Thursday.
today. And so you receive information for that. So I want to uh, thank uh, Judy, Dawn, and Jaden for uh, joining us today. Um, thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And uh, I hope uh, perhaps we can connect again. In a year. Yeah. So yeah, we can connect again in a year or, or uh, months from now and have time. So Jaden, did you want to? Do you want to say bye-bye to everybody? Bye-bye. Bye, Jaden. <laughs> nice bye, seeing Jayden. you. Bye. Great. Thanks, everyone. You should Thank invite you. us all back a year from now to do an assessment of what's been done in the last year. Good idea. Excellent. Good idea. <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Oh, he's trying to leave the meeting. <laughs> okay. Bye, Jaden. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Go ahead, Jaden.